there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. When this audacious paint job was unveiled in the middle of upmarket Kensington, it achieved instant notoriety and polarised opinions. You can't imagine why anybody would want to do it. It's a selfish and a pretty unneighbourly approach. How could you not improve it with red stripes? The saga of the stripy house offered a glimpse into the secret world of posh neighbours at war. I'm not going to let people get away with it. It is wrong. And when you go head to head with the millionaire next door... Hell is other people, particularly your neighbours. The fights are longer. Excuse me, neighbour, would you mind making a bit less noise? More exclusive. One person said he wouldn't complain if it was a rock concert. Clearly it was a matter of taste. And definitely more expensive. It's just common decency. You just don't do that to other people. When the designer gloves come off, everything's up for grabs. In another world, these people would be slapped with asbos. This is the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea in West London. It's the most expensive place to live in Britain. Homes cost almost six times the national average, and houses have sold for as much as 55 million pounds. An A-list cast of celebrities, the likes of Kylie Minogue, Elton John and Simon Cowell, all have homes here, which might be expensive, but they're closely packed and these upmarket streets are the scene of many a neighbourly dispute. In Holland Park last year, music legends Jimmy Page and Robbie Williams spent months locked in a planning battle over the pop star's desire to revamp his mansion. And a few streets away, the Beckhams have been infuriating local residents with their plans for a boot room, study and wine cellar in the basement of their new home, dubbed Beckingham Palace the Second. But in 2015, a neighbourly battle erupted, which made these celebrity disputes seem dull by comparison. On the 2nd of March, locals were shocked to find a once anonymous white muse property had been given a bright new look. I assume they're only there as a temporary measure to, to annoy the neighbours. Uh, I hope they'll go fairly soon. This is an in-your-face insult to the next-door neighbour and to the community. I don't like it. The stripy house caused a rumpus far beyond the royal borough, making headlines around the world. The controversial multi-million pound home has been causing quite a stir and has infuriated neighbours. Most of us think it's a bit of an eyesore and aren't all that happy about it, to be honest. It's quite distracting, as well as the fact that it's unfinished in the corner drives me absolutely mad. But the story behind this candy cane facade is anything but sweet. At its centre lies a bitter battle between two multi-millionaire neighbours, South African businessman Niall Carroll and Zipporah Lyle Mannering, the woman behind the stripes. Don't you like them? Zipporah is Chelsea born and bred. I think I was meant to be taller because I've got the feet for a taller woman, but I'm only five foot four. Although, of course, that's the perfect height for a woman. The stripy saga began when she decided to move back to her home turf, having spent a decade splitting her time between London and Geneva. I think at the end, one always wants to come home. I was brought up in Chelsea in the small flat, so I've always felt a very Chelsea person. I felt second generation. In October 2011, she spotted an old office building in a quiet Kensington cul-de-sac and offered four and a quarter million pounds for it. Niall Carroll, who already owned the house next door, bid four and a half million, saying he wanted some extra space. So Zipporah raised her offer and paid 4.75 million pounds. Cash. Niall and Zipporah became neighbors. Well, this is the interior of the house. As you can see, it's a fairly grim condition. 
But what is so interesting about it, and the reason why I bought it, is the astonishing size of the ground floor. You keep on carrying on and carrying on and carrying on, and you have something over 130 feet front to back, which is exceptional. And that's what interested me. Zipporah has bought and sold expensive property in London before. And one would have a staircase coming up here and also a lift, because I assume that I will not forever be able to run up and down five floors. From the start, this buy was a gamble. Classified as office accommodation, the building was estimated to be worth around 2.65 million less than Zipporah paid. Buyers will often pay a premium for the prospect, not the guarantee, that they'll get permission to convert office buildings into homes, which can be worth considerably more. This would be a master bedroom with, um, I have to say, what could be a fabulous terrace. Coffee out here on the days when it isn't raining sounds like a very nice idea. Zipporah's ambition was to rip down the current building and create an enormous four bedroom home in its place with a huge basement two stories deep, encompassing a gym, cinema, and a double height hall for a 20 meter swimming pool. These ambitious renovations could turn her 4.75 million pound office building into a mansion that might be worth double that. I can well understand people saying that this is very indulgent for a single woman. Do I need a swimming pool? Of course I don't. Would I like one? Yes, I love the idea of a swimming pool. Um, will it happen? Watch this space. Zipporah's plan to turn her office into a dream home is far from unique. Across England, offices are being converted into homes as part of a government policy to solve the housing crisis. But not in Kensington and Chelsea. Here, the council feared they'd lose all the borough's offices and got exemption from the proposals, which was bad news for Zipporah. While the house plans were on hold, she decided to use the office as storage. It reduced the holding costs. Instead of paying 50,000 a year for an empty office, I was paying 12,500 for storage. There was a significant other benefit. In some limited circumstances, storage properties can be converted into homes without further planning permission. I did rather think we were home and dry, but my neighbor is nothing if not determined. Her neighbor, father of two, Niall Carroll, bought his family home only a few months before Zipporah purchased the building next door and was a big fan of the area. It's very convenient from a whole host of reasons. You've got pubs, you've got schools, everything within walking distance, which was a big contrast to where we lived in Johannesburg. And we really liked the, the sense of neighborliness. Niall paid 11 and a half million pounds for his luxury house which came already kitted out with a basement and a swimming pool. Facilities Zipporah also wanted to create next door. If you have a major basement excavation next to you, particularly when you're one brick away from pile drivers and banging and scraping and vibration and so on, you might as well move out of your home. So when she submitted her first planning application for a double basement in April 2013, Niall objected. The most irritating thing is the hypocrisy of it all. Mr. Carroll lives in a house where a large basement was built. He lives in a house which he completely refurbished, giving the neighbours hell for six months. I don't think you can say, well, because the Queen has a, a tiara, everybody else should be allowed a tiara. I mean, you know, it's a different set of circumstances. 20 other people also objected, and the application was refused. Undaunted, Zipporah submitted six further applications, and each time, Niall objected. What they have is a license to object, but I don't think that should be a license to be objectionable. After months of refusals, Zipporah appealed to an independent inspector and finally got the right to change her office into a home. But this wasn't the end of the story. Niall took this decision to the High Court, arguing he hadn't been properly consulted 
and the permission was quashed. Less than two weeks later, the neighbours got a surprise. I haven't had much pleasure out of my investment in the house. Um, it's a very ugly frontage at the moment, and I thought it would both cheer the house up and cheer me up if I had it painted. So I did. It's not perfect, but it has charm. My neighbour didn't like the red and white stripes, and I suppose that made them more attractive to me. But the bold paint job signalled a new chapter in an epic neighbourly dispute that would see Zipporah face criminal prosecution and take this fight all the way to a public inquiry costing hundreds of thousands of pounds. This was supposed to be a lifetime home, and it looks like it's going to be a sarcophagus. On the 2nd of March, 2015, in the midst of a planning dispute with her neighbours, Zipporah Lyle Mannering gave her Kensington News property a bold, stripy paint job. Look, the front door is hideous, isn't it? How could you not improve it with red stripes? I hadn't realised the red was quite as vibrant as it is, but then I usually wear tinted glasses, so it didn't bother me that much. Zipporah's stripy situation arose after her neighbours objected to her spicing up her new property with a basement cinema, swimming pool and a gym. For many, a purpose-built basement for just these facilities might seem extreme, but for Britain's wealthiest people, they're becoming standard issue. In northwest London, no one understands the desires and demands of multimillionaires better than Hampstead estate agent Trevor Abramson. We handle properties up to 200 million pounds each. I'd love to tell you about the most expensive and most important property we've ever, we've ever sold, but I'd have to kill you first. Now, welcome to one of the gems of the area, which is about 17,000 square foot. And it has every accoutrement you'd ever want. This 24 million pound mansion in Highgate, Northwest London, comes complete with a two-story basement, housing staff quarters, cinema, sauna, spa, and gym. The person buying this property likens it to a cross between a private country estate and a seven-star spa. All these facilities aren't so much as a luxury or even a surprise. It is an expectation, if you will. Digging deep to fulfill these expectations is causing problems to erupt between some of Britain's millionaire neighbours. Ricky Gervais's Hampstead neighbours weren't amused when he announced plans to build an entertainment suite complete with sauna, pool and golf simulator in the basement of his home. And football club owner Roman Abramovich upset some of his neighbours in 2013 with his plans for a vast basement build under his Chelsea property. The development was scheduled to last three years and was said to bring the property's estimated value to nearly a hundred million pounds. The epicentre of the basement building boom is Kensington and Chelsea, because property here goes on the market for over a thousand pound per square foot on average, the most expensive in the UK, and nearly 20% pricier than its closest rival, Westminster. Planning restrictions in the borough discourage building up, so digging down can be the only option. But it's a major undertaking. Richard Sadler is managing director of one of the country's growing number of basement contractors. This is Abingdon Road. This is two new build properties. Each property is 6,500 square feet um, and consists of triple basements in each of the properties. So that's three levels below ground and four levels above ground. 
each property will be 12 and a half to 13 million when they're finished. Big money. Big money, yeah, big money. I won't be living in one. Just a little bit out of my price range. Typical buyer for this property, I would see being someone from overseas. They're all trying to get the money into bricks and mortar in London. You know, it's tangible. It's, it's a good investment. This triple basement is costing just under three million pounds to build and fit out, but could add more than seven million to the value of this property when it's completed. This is a basement on steroids. I've been in the building game close to 30 years and I still come to this site and just stand there like, like you've just seen it for the first time, because it's awesome. As an expert in basement digs, Richard knows just how much excavations can upset the neighbours. Some of our projects in other parts of London, which aren't as intense as this, 20, 30, 40 calls, just, you know, my dog's waking up. Someone keeps waking my cat up. Stuff like that, not quite as trivial as that, but you know what I'm talking about. But for Kensington and Chelsea's planning department, the borough's basement boom has been a nightmare. This has been probably the single most annoying planning issue that this borough has ever had. And a lot of our residents feel that those building them are actually bringing in a sort of chaos to the area that we didn't see 20 years ago. In 2001, Kensington and Chelsea received only 46 applications for new basements. In 2013, they received 450, nearly a tenfold increase. And more than 30 of these were for super basements of two or more levels. In 2015, the council introduced a policy to discourage super basements. And from April 2016, all basements need full planning permission. What is really catching us out is the average basement only have to pay as a planning application fee about £195 but it costs about £650 in officer time, and all taxpayers are paying for that. Planning fees in England are set at a national level, and recent research suggests that councils have had to spend nearly half a billion pounds underwriting the cost of dealing with planning applications in the past three years. Kensington and Chelsea alone spent over £14 million on planning services last year, more than double the previous year's costs and the drilling down is causing headaches outside the council chamber as complaints and disputes between posh neighbours build up. Writer Rachel Johnson, sister to London's Mayor Boris, got so cross about basement digging in her neighbourhood that she made it a major plot point in her latest novel, Fresh Hell. Why don't you get a sense of the noise? Come, come with me and just hear the, the this sound, constant sound of, of drilling and jugga jugga jugga. It goes on all day, every day, apart from Sunday and half of Saturday. This. Imagine that when you're trying to write a finely crafted column or a novel about the asses who build basements in Notting Hill. All basement firms in Kensington and Chelsea are restricted to conducting noisy digs during permitted working hours. But because Rachel works from home during the day, these excavations are getting under her skin. The owners get everything. They get the, you know, the big underground area for the kids and the nanny and the cars and the gym. And, and the neighbours get all the downside, all of it. Hell is other people, particularly your neighbours. And the fact is, is that however much neighbours complain, more and more people want to do them. It's like cigarettes at a dinner party. As soon as someone lights up, everyone else wants one. What one wants to say to them is, just buy a bigger house, go somewhere else. Don't destroy our lives. Thornset, the developers working near Rachel, notify immediate neighbors of any major events they undertake. They say they listened to the local residents' concerns and decided to reduce the size of the single basement substantially. You can see that this isn't large Victoria, you know, these are not mansions. These are reasonably medium-sized terraced houses. In another world, these people would be slapped with asbos. It's antisocial from soup to nuts. It's November 2015 
and planning permission is still up in the air. But Ms. Lyle Mannering is pressing on. She recognises that her desire to build a luxury basement will never be popular. Any kind of building work is difficult for neighbours. Um, a mad DIY next door can be really annoying. Um, but if you have good builders, good structural engineers, good plans, you can get the thing done as quickly as possible and it's over. Hello there. Today, she's looking round a basement with state-of-the-art facilities built by Richard Sadler from New Build. We'll go down and you can see... This is leather, isn't it? Yeah, that's I'm leather, I'm just yeah. doing that in something else that I've got. I think it's so nice as a balustrade. OK, yeah. No, it works well. We've done a quite a nice-sized uh, storey height. Very nice. This must be, yeah. what, four metres? No, this is three metres. And through here, this is another bedroom, ensuite bedroom. You know, traditionally, this would be staff. Yeah. Some people make really horrible staff rooms, but this is a nice one. Yeah. So, an indelicate question, what's it on at? This is on currently on the market for £10 million. What's the square footage? 4,257. So, sort of about 2,300 a square yeah, foot? Yeah, around that. I thought the house was very interesting. The builders had done a really nice job. They'd expanded the house, and people now like more space. It's only in London that we're used to living in these tiny little spaces. And going down is a way of getting more space without making a blot on the landscape. A few miles away in Hampstead, it's not just building works that are causing a ruckus. Homes here cost nearly five times the UK average and can fetch as much as 34 million pounds. This green oasis has attracted many a celebrity, including Jonathan Ross, Harry Styles, and Liam Gallagher. And what they expect of an area described as an urban village is quiet enjoyment. That's something Tom Conti, theater director and Oscar-nominated actor, is furious he's no longer getting. Why? It's not due to a basement dig. It's down to leaf blowers. Every autumn, an army of gardeners wielding these petrol-powered pests descends on Hampstead and its suburbs. Hired by the area's wealthy homeowners to keep their grand gardens pristine, the howling cacophony their blowers make is infuriating him. When we moved into this house um, 30 years ago, this was a really very, very quiet area. Um, it was very peaceful. People would come and say, gosh, it's like being in the country, and, and it was. And then uh, new people started to move into the area, and they didn't seem to understand the rules, um, which is that you don't make noise. It's very, very loud and unnecessary. And these people can't stand the sight of a leaf on this. It's not a leaf blower they need, it's a psychiatrist. Garden maintenance is a £1.3 billion industry. But with wages averaging less than £10 an hour and fierce competition for work, many gardeners feel leaf blowers enable them to work more efficiently. Now, some residents are demanding they are outlawed. The noise is deafening. The noise is torture. If it, if it is next door, it's absolutely unbearable. I would say they're noisy, but it's, um, I just can't do the job without them. <laughs> I feel it's a bit unjustified coming from a, a suburb like Hampstead because very often it's my customers in Hampstead that will drive the price down of my work, which is why I need to buy machinery like leaf blowers to be efficient at my job. In neighbouring Hampstead Garden suburb, some people are so angry they're taking matters into their own hands. Retired stockbroker Gary Shaw is secretary of the Residents Association. Its members are dishing out football-style yellow and red warning cards to neighbours who disturb the peace of the suburb with their leaf blowers. The thinking behind the cards was that it's often very difficult to knock on the door of a neighbour who's making noise and to have a conversation about it at that point. The temperature very quickly rises. We thought that by providing these cards and presenting the thing in a very polite manner, we might help to diffuse any of these possibilities and perhaps achieve our aims. Hello. Nicola, hi. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. How are you? Got some cards for you. Nicola is one of the most prolific card issuers. We're trying to make it a taboo 
rather like um, dog fouling on pavements is unacceptable. The red card is that you're sent off, so we'd like to think you're sent off the street if you misbehave. <laughs> very English way of dealing with things. I think it's a very Hampstead Garden suburb way of dealing with things. Leaf blowers might be one thing, but a full-blown orchestra over the garden fence is something quite different. One person said he wouldn't complain if it was a rock concert, so clearly it wasn't the noise, it was just a matter of taste. Many of us have disputes with people next door, but when posh neighbours fall out, they can take it to a different level. In March 2015, in the midst of a planning dispute, Zipporah Lyle Mannering decided to spruce up the front of a property in London's exclusive Kensington and Chelsea. You know there's a big um, discussion going on about whether the, the stripes are white or the stripes are red. Is it white stripes on a red house or red stripes on a white house? It hadn't actually occurred to me, but it's a subject of much debate. The controversy thrust her into the limelight, but much of the attention was unwelcome. I did have a rather nasty little note pushed through my letterbox, which said, you are a disgrace, I hope you rot in hell. But there is a certain hatred about somebody who has toughens more than you have. Um, no doubt it would be admirable if I spent all my money doing good works. I'm just not that nice a person. Zipporah's stripes quickly made her local vocal enemies, like Michael Barb, who lives just around the corner. Well, you come around the corner, and I think you get knocked sideways by... You, you can't imagine why anybody would want to do it. Michael is on the planning committee at the Kensington Society, an influential organisation that works to protect the borough's buildings. Everybody was shocked, but didn't know what to do about it. I can take a joke, but this is not a joke. <laughs> so the first thing I did was contact the council and say, can you do anything about this? Michael's complaint landed on the desk of Kensington and Chelsea's planning department, led by councillor Tim Coleridge. Are there a lot of neighbour disputes in your borough? Generally. Uh, when you have a borough that has nearly 7,000 planning applications a year, you're always going to get somebody who wants to do something that other neighbours don't want to see happen. In May 2015, nine weeks after Zipporah transformed her property into a cascade of candy stripes, the council took action. We rather hoped that the owner of the house would uh, see the joker slightly worn off and would paint it back to a perfectly normal colour. And uh, when that wasn't forthcoming, uh, we perfectly legitimately issued a 215 notice. Councils usually serve 215 notices to force owners to make repairs when their properties are in such bad condition they're bringing the neighbourhood into danger or disrepute. Zipporah's 215 notice demanded she paint her property white within 28 days and warned it was a criminal offence if she didn't comply. Are there other properties that have got 215s for the colour they're painted? Uh, I can't think of a single one, no. By and large, in the United Kingdom, you can paint your house any colour you like, but you can't uh, when you are in the middle of a conservation area. Conservation areas, introduced in 1967 to protect places of special historic or architectural interest, have strict rules on altering properties. Nearly 50% of the London borough of Camden, home to Leafy Hampstead, is in a conservation zone. That can be bad news for people wanting to modernise their homes. Even a Hampstead celebrity like Boy George was refused permission to change the exterior of his Grade 2 listed house when the planning inspector decided it would harm the building's architectural significance. Unlike Boy George's, Zipporah's property in Kensington and Chelsea is not listed, but does lie in one of the borough's 35 conservation areas. She's adamant there are no rules dictating what colour she can paint it. I think it is my right to paint it as I wish. It's what is called a permitted development right to paint your, paint your house. 
and the definition is the application of any colour. Well, I've applied any colour. The only way to challenge the council's 215 order is to take them to court, which could cost tens of thousands of pounds, a price Zipporah thought worth paying. It also had the side benefit of buying the stripes a stay of execution until things were resolved. See some quite bright little colours up Next there. Step. It's November 2015, and while she's waiting for her day in court, Zipporah is hunting for other brightly coloured properties in the borough to bolster her case that this paint job isn't exceptional. This street, people have painted their house the way they wish. And I think that's very charming, even, even when it's a colour that I personally wouldn't have chosen. But it's not my business. Once the council has said that I can't do it, that is a red rag to a bull. I would say it's a little more exciting than mine. Um, it's got murals as well as stripes going in several different directions. It is an issue of abuse of authority. I'm not terribly keen on proper authority, let alone an abuse of authority. It's so un-English. Well, clearly, I don't think serving a 215 notice in that case is, a, is an abuse of authority. There's nothing heavy-handed about that. You could say it's heavy-handed to paint a beautiful house red and white. I have got rather cross about it. I'm not going to let people get away with it. It is wrong. Loud colours aren't the only cause of friction between well-heeled residents and the council. Excessive noise is the leading source of neighbourly problems in Britain, with over 200,000 complaints made to councils a year. One such complaint happened when a party was held at Jude Law's house in February 2016. Neighbours phoned police and noise protection were called out. It's unknown if Law was even there. But when the tranquility of the countryside is broken, that can really cause problems. This is Winslow Hall in Buckinghamshire, the unlikely source of neighbours' noise complaints after it changed hands in 2012. Eventually, you get to the point where you say, excuse me, neighbour, would you mind making a bit less noise? The hall was designed in the 17th century by Sir Christopher Wren and restored by its current owners, Christopher Gilmore, son of late Conservative Minister Lord Ian Gilmore, Christopher's wife, Marty, and Tipsy. Baby dog. Tony and Cherie Blair were looking at the house and it was rumoured that they were about to buy it. And um, I think we became rather popular in the time when we emerged as people who did buy it because we weren't the Blairs. And the villagers were so welcoming when we moved in because we, we were sent bottles of champagne and we were invited to dinner everywhere, which was so nice. The Gilmores have spent over £800,000 restoring this period property. It's amazing wallpaper. I think it must be from the 60s, but I, I was going to change it all, but I just think it's so fun. I mean, don't see that anymore. For the Gilmores, the old house formed the perfect backdrop for Christopher's passion, opera. I suppose I first really became very keen on opera in my very early teens, 12, 13, 14. And um, gradually I became more and more obsessed by it. So in 2012, they began hosting their very own opera festival in the grounds of their estate. The stage is bang in front of the house. The orchestra is probably where we're standing here. And the, this is magical because there's this huge, wonderful feeling. Accompanied by a 30-piece orchestra, the stage was filled with professional singers belting out arias, up to 100 decibels, making as much noise as a low-flying jet. But it's not for one night only. The festival runs for four evenings, attracting 1,800 opera aficionados from across the UK, 
paying £75 a head. Presumably you make lots of money out of this. No. It is certainly not a project which is going to make me a lot of money, that's for sure. It's well, a labour of love. Yeah. It's his passion. Opera is his passion, so... And it, it's your passion too? Well, yes. <laughs> My passion as well. <laughs> But not everyone in Winslow shares the Gilmore's passion for overtures and arias. And this country mansion has neighbours. This is effectively a mansion in the middle of a town. And people started to contact me as their local councillor, who were clearly and understandably upset by the ongoing noise. For the first two years of the festival, the Gilmore's neighbours weren't just listening to the highlights of the performances, they were hearing the bum notes of the rehearsals as well. Any one of us would be irritated by a neighbour who, day after day, made the same noise. They didn't ask for the opera to come over the fence from them. I remember opening our window and, and seeing one of the girls rehearsing in the Rose Garden and it was the most magical morning with this purity of voice and, and I don't know why anyone would think that was not fabulous. In total, six of the Gilmore's neighbours complained to the council in 2013. Enough to set in motion the most upmarket of noise investigations by environmental health. The bulk of our noise complaints tend to be domestic noise issues. So that would be dog barking or noise from stereos and things like that. Not always operas. <laughs> Local residents were complaining that the noise was keeping them awake at night, that they could hear the noise very clearly in their own living rooms, you know, above the, the noise of the radio or the television. So we decided to serve a noise abatement notice on Mr Gilmore. The noise abatement notice forced the Gilmores to stop the outdoor rehearsals. But some of the neighbours were still not satisfied. One person said he wouldn't complain if it was a rock concert, so clearly it wasn't the noise, it was just a matter of taste. If the festival attracts more complaints this summer and falls foul of the noise abatement order, the council can shut the Gilmores' beloved event down for good. It's obviously frustrating for the 1,800 people that love it to think that just a couple of people could make the whole production close down. Something the neighbours might applaud. Back in Kensington and Chelsea, Deborah Lyre Mannering's dispute with the council is moving centre stage. It's December 2015. Nearly eight months have passed since the council saw red over her stripy house and threatened Zipporah with criminal proceedings if she didn't repaint it plain white. I don't like people telling me what I should do when it's actually none of their business. If the council hadn't insisted that I get rid of them, which involves my taking the council to court, I might well have got rid of them before now. Zipporah's day in court has finally arrived. It's difficult for me to say how much I have spent on the battle because people will be outraged that I have spent that amount of money, which is incidentally 80,000 pounds, when they will feel, and quite rightly, that there are better things to spend that money on. Um, it depends whether you actually care about freedom and the rule of law, um, and I do. Um, I think it's something like three and a half thousand a stripe. It will now be down to a judge at Hammersmith's Magistrates Court to decide if the stripes can stay. Judges, like the rest of us, are victims of their own prejudices. So it depends really whether the judge is pro-freedom or pro-dullness. If the Magistrates Court is against me on the stripes, I can repaint the house. But it won't be white. It's December 2015. Nine months since Zipporah Lyre Mannering boldly transformed the facade of her Kensington and Chelsea house, and the fate of the stripes lies in the hands of a judge. And the other battle Zipporah is fighting to build a luxury home 
is stepping up a gear. She submitted seven planning applications, but her neighbour, Niall Carroll, has objected on every occasion. Niall says that he's only ever acted in the interests of his family and neighbourhood. With both sides at loggerheads, Zipporah has appealed to the government's independent planning inspector to hear her case. Now a public inquiry will be held. It's now got into inquiry mode because of the problems that my neighbour and the council have created, which of course is an expensive way for me and indeed for the council of ratepayers. For Zipporah's neighbour Niall, the inquiry offers a potential resolution to the three-year saga. You can swing your fist around as much as you like, but when it connects with somebody else's nose, that's when your ability to swing your fist around comes to an end. The joke, if you like, over the whole thing is that if he sells it, he has to tell any prospective buyer um, about his neighbour next door. And as he's painted me as the worst kind of monster, would you want to buy a house next to me? Today is the first day of the public inquiry that will determine the outcome of Zipporah's battle to turn an old office building into a dream home. The ever more acrimonious fight has dominated her life, thrust her into the public eye and cost hundreds of thousands of pounds in legal fees. I was once described as the woman who never gives up. That might not be a very sensible approach, but we are what we are. I don't enjoy this fight but I don't find it intimidating. This is the end of the line for Zipporah. on my microphone, someone just tell me. Sometimes it happened. The planning inspectorate have decided to hold a public inquiry, the most complex and costly way to resolve a planning dispute. They are more typically used for controversial major infrastructure projects, such as a new power station or motorway. The one and only time I have agreed with the council over all of this is they say it's completely ludicrous, um, it's overkill, it's a small issue that should have been decided in a small hearing. The cost to the taxpayer for holding a public planning inquiry is £18,000 on average. On top of this, Zipporah, Nile and the council are paying legal fees running to hundreds of thousands of pounds in total. It is costing me a fortune. You're spending a fortune. Presumably it's costing your neighbour a fortune as well. Um, well, I certainly hope so. The appellant is a private individual. She's free to do with her unmortgaged property as she chooses. Over the next few days, the inquiry will hear evidence on Zipporah's multiple planning applications and decide whether any of them should get the go-ahead. And so in due course, the council will be asking for all five appeal appeals to be dismissed. Uh, so Mr Carroll lives next door to the appeal site with his wife, Sue, and their children. The impact of basement development upon the quality of life and the living conditions of nearby residents has been recognised by the council and the planning inspectorate. Some people would say the amount of money and time spent on this planning dispute is outrageous when there are other people that don't have somewhere to live. The money one spends on oneself, if you look at the people who don't have money, um, always seems outrageous and obscene, but it's how people live their lives. Most of us spend our money as we wish, rather than um, doing good. This is either incompetence on a scale which beggars belief, or a further illustration that the council has one rule for the appellant and another for everyone else. Well, sir, if the latter is true, that is the world of Humpty Dumpty, against which the Supreme Court has so clearly warned. Provided there are no other matters at all, the inquiry is closed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
now it's solely down to the planning inspector to decide the fate of Zipporah's ambitions and resolve this epic neighbor's dispute. I suppose I'm angry, I'm outraged, I'm infuriated, I'm exhausted, but I am also bloody minded. The results in both the magistrate's courts and the inquiry now will be what they'll be. If I win, or when I win, which is what I would prefer, um, I will start building. And if I don't, I will use it more intensively as a warehouse. And I suspect that a building warehouse would be the most useful use of the site. We'll see how the council and my neighbours like that. How long will I live? Who knows? Mm -hmm.